as she attempts to round Cape Horn. So it's midwinter in the Southern Hemisphere. The Madeira left Glasgow in February. Its crew are no strangers to cold. They're just not used to this cold. 55 degrees south, in near perpetual darkness, the howling gales snapping off the icicles that feed on sailors' beards. The Madeira is an old ship. She's built for warmer climes, and her timbers creak with every pitch and yaw. It's in this terrible sea that Edward Albert, 21 years old, feels a throbbing in his legs. Beneath canvas trousers, his skin is paling, hardening, scabbing over. He has frostbite. He tells Captain Douglas, who orders him to his hammock. Below deck, the roll of the ship is worse than ever, the darkness total and the cold no less. Next evening, bellies rumbling, the ship's master and mate come calling for their cook and find him worse than ever. They glance at each other and they mutter. And then these two men seize hold of Edward Albert and carry him bodily to his galley kitchen. This is a cramped and guttering space, pans swing and knock against the walls. No, he must protest, he's in no state to work. But that's not what they're doing. They have come to cure him. The oven is lit and there's such a smell. In his absence, they're trying to roast a fowl. One of them fetches the bird out. He can see that bird is only half done, but still he's missing the point. The officers redouble their grip on the afflicted cook. They wrestle him to the ground. And then they thrust his numbed feet into the open red mouth of the oven. Five years later, and Henry Mayhew, of whom we've already heard, social investigator, a theatrical writer, publisher of a myriad anonymized, elaborately rewritten interviews with street workers, pays Edward Albert's family a call early one morning. Edward is now living with his wife, Ellen, Nay Buchanan, and his infant son in rooms off a little alley near Brunswick Square, Bloomsbury. Much has passed since that fateful night in the South Atlantic. And, and this is the important thing for this paper, we don't need Mayhew to tell us about it. He's come to interview Edward Albert specifically, not by chance from an encounter on the street, but because of a pamphlet Albert himself has published. This little book, eight pages long, tells it all. How Edward Albert's feet burst through the intense swelling, how mortification ensued. It tells of the double amputation in a Valparaiso hospital, of his captain's refusal to pay compensation or even settle the wages of one he considered a dead man, of his arduous route black back to Glasgow via Portsmouth, and London. It gives a paper trail, names and signatures, high authorities. Unforgettably, it tells of that ship's arrival in Valparaiso six weeks after the terrible night, six weeks at sea without any medical attention. It tells of how Albert was sent ashore on the lid of a coffin, the stench, the trance he lay in after the operation, at which point, as Albert prints it in his book, they all thought me dead. It is generally understood in hospitals that whenever a patient dies, his coffin is prepared. So it was with me. And when the man lifted me into my coffin, I came out of my trance and gave them a start. So they ran off to the doctor and told him the dead man has come to life again. When he came down, much surprised, he asked me how I felt. And I replied I was very weak. He then ordered me a glass of wine. And after I had drunk the wine, he said I had a strong constitution and would not die in a hurry. Albert subtitles his book after this incident. It's the brief sketch of the life of Edward Albert or the dead man come to life again. As subtitles go, it's hard to beat. There's so much to be said of Edward Albert. Much of it he says himself in his pamphlet and in his extensive interview with Mayhew. Much more has been said recently by the aforementioned Natalie Prizzle. So there's much more to his story. There's a fraudulent grocer in Glasgow, an ingenious tea and coffee machine that he makes himself. Uh, the mixed race wife he meets in Leeds, encounters with authority figures ranging from a port admiral to the officious local policeman in London, who now objects to Albert working as a crossing sweeper. We should note how even on the cover, he proudly proclaims himself a native of Kingston, Jamaica. But nonetheless, he affirms to Mayhew that Kingston is an English place, sir, so I am counted as not a foreigner, and that he is also a Protestant who regularly attends a church near King's Cross. He says, I never go in because of my legs, but I just go inside the door. He continues, in spite of which, many of the locals chaff me about my misfortune. They call me cripple, some say Uncle Tom, and some says, but I never takes no notice of them at all. Whether this is truth or bravado, Albert is affected enough to remember and report these ableist and racist slurs, but he refuses to be cowed. 
He's christened his, his young son, James Edward, in a moving acknowledgement of his heritage. He says to Mayhew, James is after my grandfather, who was a slave. Outrageous fortune, a sea of troubles, he has contended with it all. And like Johnson and Waters a generation before him, Albert confronts his pain every day. Mayhew notes that he sweeps a crossing in a principal and central thoroughfare when the weather is cold enough to let him walk. The colder the better, he says, as it numbs his stumps like. He is unable to follow this occupation in warm weather as his legs feel just like corns and he cannot walk more than a mile a day. He suffers phantom limbs too. He says to Mayhew, oh yes, I feel my feet still. It is just as if I had them sitting on the floor now. I feel my toes moving like as if I had them. I had a corner on one of my toes and I can feel it still, particularly at the change of weather. Ruefully, he recalls better times, perhaps in Glasgow, when he was more properly equipped to manage his disability. I used to get about a little with two small crutches and I also had a little cart before that on three wheels. It was made by a man in the hospital. I used to lash myself down in it. That was the best thing I ever had. But none of this in all its richness is what marks out Edward Albert as a street professional. In fact, he'd be the last person to use that label. He had a profession even after his injury. In a stroke of advertising genius that um, will be familiar to many of us and he's referenced it already, he opened a coffee house in Glasgow called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, trading on the obsession at the time with uh, the novel by Harriet Beecher Stowe. And he still sees himself as a respectable victualler. I am not a common cook either, he declares to Mayhew. I am a pastry cook. Many of you who've seen much MasterChef will realise that is something of a speciality. Um, his current occupation as a crossing sweeper, he dismisses as mere begging for all that it serves a purpose and that he makes up to two shillings a day, which is maybe double the going rate. All he wants is three pounds in capital so he can open a coffee shop again. Until then, he sees himself only as a beggar. But he does himself an injustice. Pastry chef he may be, but Edward Albert has another calling. He is a writer. His last journey from Glasgow to London was by road. En route, like other bookselling itinerants before him, he had his eight page book reprinted more than once. The copy Mayhew handles, which is now completely lost to us, is published at Hull by a William Howe, whom I'm presuming is a relative of the ballad printer John Howe, based at 48 Blanket Row Hull. Despite the fact that this latter printer has a woodcut of a sailing ship that would do very nicely for the cover of the book, Howe and Albert together have improvised a cover portrait of Albert, which they have recycled from a racist cartoon used to sell tobacco papers, as is evidenced, says Mayhew, by the traces of a tobacco pipe, which has been unskillfully erased. So you can imagine them taking a, a small gouging tool to the woodcut and, and try to, to edit this for its new purpose. The copy Grizzle has discovered, by contrast, is printed by R. Atkinson, 206 High Street, Sunderland. And Atkinson's edition is embellished with a glorious woodcut, I think, of a British frigate under full sail. It's worth pausing here on the specific choices, so far as they were choices, that Albert made in concert with his different publishers. One edition is illustrated with an adapted blackface minstrel image, the other with a ship. Each key aspects of both Albert's identity and his narrative, but each surely adopted under sufferance, the connotations being those of racist abuse on the one hand and the traumatic scene of his injuries on the other. If we look at the full sheet published by John rather than William Howe in Hull, we find an uncanny pairing of these two subjects, yet neither of them has been used for John Howe's um, edition. Perhaps the relevant blocks were lost or simply not passed between the family members. But their topical currency on this broadside of a very similar date uh, shows that from exactly the same area shows that both of Albert's actual images he used um, were in vogue, astute choices where his market was concerned. It's interesting too how closely his relationship with printers echoes that of itinerant print sellers a generation earlier, such as John McGee and David Love, both of whom took their works with them to be restocked by new printers in each town they came to. Those men, of course, had full use of their legs. So Albert has not only somehow worked his way down England's eastern seaboard, he's negotiated with several printers, sold enough copies to necessitate reprints, and taken shrewd editorial decisions about cover images and knockout subtitles. So what if the printers he uses are so strapped for typeface and time that they are forced to substitute letters all over the place, eschew most of the punctuation, and put half of the E's and A's upside down? It's still a compelling narrative, backed up by official documents reproduced on the fifth of his eight pages, 
and rounded off with an eight verse adaptation of the prose account that Albert may well have sung himself, though he's not going to admit to anything so degrading as ballad singing in front of Henry Mayhew. I will give you the song. Its verse is tidied up and its typeface standardized, but its spelling and its grammar left intact. <clears throat> Unto a sad and mournful tale, kind Christians pray attend. For I am unfit to labour quite, or may you stand, my friend. On board the bark Madeira, from Glasgow we set sail, and for some time we all enjoyed a sweet and pleasant gale. As cook on board, my duty done for captain and for crew, a faithful trusty servant they, Edward Albert, knew. Twas in 1851 we rounded off Cape Horn, and oftentimes I grieved of being that ever I was born. For on a cold and bitter night, my precious limbs were lost. Oh, how I prayed for morning, so piercing was thy frost. The surgeon came to save my life, my sufferings then were great. He brought his instruments and knife, my legs to amputate. And from that hour, my sufferings in prayer I sympathize. When horrified, I hear men curse their precious limbs and eyes. I cannot labour for my bread, give what you can afford, and God, who doth the ravens feed, will in heaven reward. It's an absolutely classic narrative ballad, going through all the usual moves. It's consistent metre, making it easy to sing to any number of well-known tunes. As you can hear, I've chosen a rather crude and inaccurate approximation of the 17th century tune, The Lady's Fall. Largely because when I see that metre, the melody immediately enters my head to the obliteration of all others. Albert will almost certainly have heard and perhaps sung something different, but like most ballad printers of his era, he's happy to leave the choice of tune or to have no tune at all up to the individual purchaser. He clearly has a gift for all that he disclaims it. And this is the really fascinating thing about his situation. A proud professional man, much injured, much aggrieved, he hates to be reduced to what he thinks of as begging. But this begging involves the composition, publication, sale, and possibly the performance of a remarkable piece of writing. He not only has this pamphlet, he also has a placard with a, with a short edited version of the same account that he uh, wears sometimes when out and when sweeping his crossing to, to gain more attention, lead people in, and then can sell them the pamphlet. It only exists because of ill fortune, but it gives Albert a voice, a vehicle for literary self-expression, that few street professionals possessed. His name is remembered, utterly unlike so many of those female ballad singers in Ireland that Catherine was telling us about earlier. Joseph Johnson and Billy Waters, meanwhile, for all of their relative fame, sing the words of others and have no control over how they are written up or remembered. Albert can tell his own account. And even in the more celebrated pages of Mayhew, this gets him an honor that almost none of Mayhew's thousand interviewees is accorded. He's not only named, he is cited and his own compositions excerpted within Mayhew's own publications, along with enough details that it suggests Albert approved the reproduction, the better to access Mayhew's wider readership and their potential charity. We know this worked for other individuals in Mayhew, who received substantial donations as a result of the publication, enabling them to purchase new instruments or wares to sell. The same thing happens in uh, a publication by, by Jack Rag, where he um, seems to have a very specific relationship with one match seller um, in um, Clare Market and gives very specific details of where to find her in Clare Market and at home in case people want to send her money. It's not uncommon. So this may just have worked for Albert too. Such is the power of popular print in this era, both truly cheap in Albert's case and serialised in Mayhew's first publications in the Morning Chronicle. Marketed in the right way, a piece of cheap print could be literally life-changing. Thank you. Now I'll work out how, have I stopped sharing? Yes. Oh, Siri, that was great. Um, does anybody have any questions? Questions in the room. Okay. I'll repeat the ones in the room, yeah. Anybody in the room got any questions? Or are there any on the chat, Harry? Have you been looking? Not at the moment. Any questions on the chat? Oh, I yes. Up. Uh, earlier, but, uh, she's still, my, my we, we've one at the back here, yeah. 
Oh yeah, and that's fascinating talk. I, I'm not, I'm a, a member of the public at this conference, so no expert. Um, I just was wondering if um, I found the uh, the narrative of the you know the uh, uh, the play performance of identity really interesting in terms of the of the taste of the time, you know. I mean that I know I've forgotten his name. I was the tattooed Irish man had a memoir as well. In the earlier 80s, about the mid 1830s, um, a narrative about being shipwrecked of the, um, you might not have forgotten the gone blank of his name, but, uh, uh, and uh, I found though that, that the in comparison though that uh, uh, Edward Alberts is very disruptive because he seems to sort of want to cut, he comes into the Commons kind of thing, you know, Lindbad's Commons. He seems to undercut uh, exoticism, you know, so. He says, keeps to his England's coffee shop. And then it's very content, um, mercantile and you know, Mark is in his brands for the Uncle Tom's cabin. Um, so I find that very interesting. So but without going anything about it myself, I'm just wondering, in the other ballads, so you notice that there's, there's, there's uh, that while he's reproducing to Sean or in some ways, he's undercutting as well in his uh, memoir. Bringing in this kind of counter narrative, and I think of thinking to what would have called double consciousness there in some ways. I find very interesting. The whole thing is would you that would be the question? Do you see kind of double consciousness of not being pigeonholed as a black uh, in a sense, but playing it too? Can you hear that, Oscar? Uh, I, so could, I could hear. Almost all of that, I think, and that is a fascinating is there a double question. Consciousness there is he playing, uh, you know, on the one hand, um, kind of uh, you using his blackness on the one hand and his disability and that's the, and being Jamaican and all that and undercutting. Yeah, it would be the modern business English businessman. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it it seems and and British rather than English because he he has a strong. Uh, I mean, he's most successful when he's in Glasgow and. People have traced his his later life and having spent time in London, he returns north again and he's desperate to um, get compensation and that requires him to, to travel north once more. And he his family spent time in industrial towns in the north of England and back in Scotland. But you said counter narrative and double consciousness. And that is so true and fascinating. <clears throat> it reminds me of Joseph Johnson's ability to perform a very patriotic English sailor identity at the same time as using the traditions of, of um, Caribbean John Canoe in the same performance and people do not realize what he's doing. There's a similar <coughs> having two things at once, but for Albert, he breaks it up into these different media. It's a bit like David Love of Nottingham publishes a prose and a verse account of his autobiography. There's something similar here because in the in the ballad, um, there's no particular sense of identity. It's about um, or not of racial identity. It's 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 the narrative. Um, it's the sensational incident. It's the it's the piety. It's the moral at the end that is so very much playing into gen into a generic perspective and could stand alone from him representing it or being involved at all. And you could see him having that almost for one audience or, or one perspective. And then the full prose account, which is which combines legal documentation and, and very clear accounts of his career, as you say, as a as a businessman and a, and a Briton as something slightly different. So, I mean, I think like most people, he is holding several identities at the same time, but he's also able to flip between them as best fits the, the form of what he's doing, which I find really interesting. And his um, his religious identity also, I think his Protestantism is quite is quite key there. Um, and clearly he does. He has taken on board the fact that people are marking him out as, as different in various ways. And he's asserting the ways in which he's a, a, a productive, industrious member of this society and identifying as a Briton at the same time as being very clear of his heritage. I just think it's a really interesting combination of things. But the one thing he will not go into is is the idea that he is a crossing sweeper or a beggar. Um, he, he is deeply resistant to being pigeonholed in that way. So at no point does he um, claim charity because of his um, situation on the street, simply through his disability. So there's a distinction there too. Great question. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Catherine, can I? Hi. Yeah. Uh, thanks for being a great presentation. 
Uh, the, the song, the song itself, uh, uh, would it be would it be sung in in uh, uh, British folk clubs and English folk clubs? I, I, I this is the first time I've heard, I've heard of that particular story. I mean, would say on your Friday night down the dog and duck, is somebody going to sing this song? No, <laughs> that's that's about it. Um, and I've I've never encountered this song outside the pages of the pamphlet, which was lost for generations. This is, I think, for all that it has. Um, those sort of generic familiar tropes of a genre and could perceivably pass beyond his identity. I, there's no sense that it that it ever has or has gained a life outside of his own production and marketing and selling of it. I think it, it sort of stays with him. It doesn't doesn't go off anywhere. And maybe the particularities of the incident, um, I think I think if it were to go on, it would be more of a third person thing. But because the I mean the story in it is sensational and unique, but very clear. I don't know. And maybe he was no singer himself either. Um, and there's not an iconic performance to to stamp it to, but but no, it is not one that has endured in any way, which is slightly sad. Okay, thanks. So I see uh, Maura, I think, has her hands up in the um, in the chat. Is there a question for Maura? We're just allowing your mic for the moment, Andy Maura. Moira, um, if you want to ask a question, I see your hand is up. I don't think the mic's enabled, actually. She has a turn. Oh, you, I think you have to turn your mic on, Moira, if you want to ask a question, or you can put it in the chat. Otherwise, I'm happy to enable us to keep to time, which is unheard of for this oh, event. <laughs> Uh, I have just one thing to ask Oscar, which is, and um, I know he, you mentioned in this up, they had a little cart at one stage to get around mm. and various other ways. But I mean, a cross sweeper on the street is, uh, especially in bad weather, uh, which he preferred, uh, seems rather a dangerous occupation for somebody who uh, had that disability. I'm just wondering, like, how was he sweeping the street with his, uh, with his <clears throat> leg amputated? Yeah, it's an immensely difficult job. And I've come across accounts of other crossing sweepers that make clear just how difficult this is at the time right because firstly there's the danger of traffic but also the amount of, of dirt and things that and come up it's kind of a full bridge, but they were very popular in london and very busy very busy crossings and there was quite a union almost of um you had your like a patch you had your patch cross sweep um, oh they're like deeply territorial patch. yeah but but also there is there is variation between crossings right and i feel there is a difference between those crossing sweepers who are essential and important around major thoroughfares and are, are getting remunerated quite a lot for doing really important work and certain back streets where it's kind of a sinecure where it's kind of a I'm here with a broom on this crossing where you might go I don't actually have to do anything because this is not somewhere there's much traffic or, or anything um, it's a legitimate way of, of standing here and, and claiming a bit of arms from passers-by and he does seem to fall more on the second side of that line but we just don't know it's possible that um, he has some similar contraption by this point that enables him to do a little more but i would i couldn't imagine him say being near charing cross and doing this i think his sort of bloomsbury backwater location might have something to do with the fact that he's he's claiming that occupation yeah it's a good point thank you very much oscar I thank you